Hi, I'm Dave, and I want to add to Karen's welcome, say delighted you decided to join us, especially if it's your first time checking out church, or maybe you're a regular Kingsgate member from one of our locations in Peterborough, Cambridge, Leicester, or London. Today, I want to bring a special message that I trust will help all of us in this unprecedented crisis that we're facing, and also as a way of connecting with the fact that today is Mother's Day. Uh, we all are aware that we're facing a real crisis. It's actually a twofold crisis. On the one hand, there's the actual virus with all the economic impact and the disruption that all of us are facing. And then there's something else that's adding to the problem, and it's the problem of fear. You see, fear has the effect of amplifying the situation. I saw uh, an article uh, just recently saying the governor of New York saying that the that fear and panic is outpacing the virus. Now, uh, looking at the whole subject of fear, fear is not just related to our current situation. Fear has always been a human problem. And so I did a bit of a search online and found out some fears that people face. Um, here's, here's a list. You might like to see if you can say them along with me. The first one is globophobia, which is the fear of balloons. Then there's pognophobia, which is the fear of beards. I particularly shave today so as not to frighten anyone. Um, and then there's one that I can't really say. Don't know whether you can say it back at home. It's the fear of peanut butter sticking to your mouth. And then I definitely can't say this one. It's the fear of long words. And then this one's my favorite. It's the fear of being watched by a duck. Now, if you've got that problem, I'll pray for you specially at the end of the service. Um, so it seems like we have the capacity to be afraid about almost anything. Now, let me just say that fear um, in and of itself is not always bad. I mean, there's a thing called wisdom. So take the current crisis we're facing. Um, it wouldn't be fearful to wash our hands or to self-isolate. That would be wisdom. But there's another kind of fear, like an irrational fear, that grabs us and can actually distort the reality of the situation we're facing. Fear, you see, can turn what is a medical and economic crisis into a potential mental health crisis. We can't control a lot of what's happening, but what we can do is seek God and ask him to help us deal with fear. You see, what fear does is fear causes a sense of panic. You know, I'm sure we've all either witnessed firsthand or heard about, you know, the stories of panic buying. Um, you know, I can't really get a hold of the fact, you know, what, what's this thing about toilet rolls? Why are people suddenly mass buying toilet rolls? O on another level, I heard of somebody who came into a barber's recently and, you know, the friend was telling me, he said, um, I've just gone and bought 48 hand sanitizers. The friend, uh, my friend turned to him and said, you know, why do you do that? And he said, because my wife is in a panic. And actually, I, I felt a sense of empathy because you see, Right now, there are a lot of situations out there that are causing real panic, real fear. And you may right now be facing a, a tough, tough situation, maybe to do with your family, maybe it's a, a fear of a work situation. So fear causes us to panic. It also can cause us to catastrophize. In other words, the situation's bad, but fear makes it look a lot worse. I was just in uh, Tesco's this week and uh, the lady who was serving me basically said, the world's coming to an end. And I thought, well, the situation's bad, but right now I'm not, not sure whether the world is actually coming to an end. Part of the problem you see is that we lose perspective when fear has a grip of our lives. You know, I, I'm a historian by background and I know from, uh, if you look back at history, you'll see that m many generations in the past, they faced wars, plagues, epidemics, and society came through the other side. Can I say that? We will get through this crisis. And so I believe it's important that we don't let fear cause us to completely lose perspective. Now, that's the bad news. Fear has a big impact. But the good news is there is an antidote to fear. And the antidote to fear is perfect love. The Bible has a lot to say about love. One of the most important verses is in 1 John 4, verse 18. It says, perfect love casts out fear. You know, the love of God, the love of God, knowing God's love for us and receiving his love is the number one, number one way 
that fear gets driven out of our lives. And so on Mother's Day, I want to talk about the love of God and I want to relate it to uh, the love that a mother has. And, you know, can I say that, you know, wherever you're at with uh, your experience of your mother, whether, um, you know, you, you never knew your mother or you didn't have a great relationship or maybe you've recently lost your mother or, you know, you feel the pain of not being able to be with her this Mother's Day because of the situation. Can I tell you that God is the perfect parent? And he can be the mother or the father that you wish you'd had or you never knew. And so what I want to do is I want to give you seven key truths that I trust will help you. It, this is like good news. You see, while on the one hand we need to be informed about what's going on, if all the time we're sort of feeding our minds with, with more and more bad news, it can really increase the fear in our lives. And so I trust, if you like, that these truths about the love of God will be like an antidote to fear in our lives. So here's, here's the first truth, that God, in his perfect love, God hears our cry. In his perfect love, God hears our cry. I remember when our girls were, were, were tiny and, um, you know, Karen, my wife, had almost like an internal alarm system. You know, even the slightest little muffle next door and she'd be awake. Um, I would dutifully sleep through the whole thing, but she would wait. Why? Because she was attentive and alert to the cry of those little ones. Can I say God's like that and even more so? Listen to this uh, beautiful uh, psalm. It, psalm 18 verse 6 says, I cried out to you in my distress, the delivering God, and from your temple throne you heard my troubled cry. My sobs came right into your heart and you turned your face to rescue me. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, you see, when, when we're in distress, when we're in trouble, we can cry to the Lord. We don't have to pray sophisticated prayers. In fact, you may be watching here today and you don't know, really know how to pray to, at all. Can I say simple prayer, four-letter four prayer? Help! You can just ask God, help, and he'll hear your cry. Or you might like to simply pray the Lord's Prayer. Oh, I've got good news for you. God loves you and he wants to hear your cry and come to you. That's the first thing. Secondly, in his perfect love, God comforts us. You see, for those of us who are parents, there's like a, a natural response when our children are suffering or in distress. We want to go to them. We want to talk with them. We want to find out what the problem is. We want to hug them. We want to reassure them. We want to comfort them. Can I say God is like that and even more? Isaiah 66 verse 13, this is God speaking. It says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. you. Right now, you may need God's comfort like never before. I want to tell you, he's here, he's near, and he wants to comfort you. But even if right now you're not feeling very troubled or even fearful at all, I'm sure you're aware there are people all around you who are facing this sense of fear and panic and distress. Why not just pray and ask God to help you comfort others around you? I believe that now is a time like never before for us to show the love of God, maybe lend a listening ear. You know, within the, the, the confines of social distancing and using wisdom, maybe even just through technology, we need to encourage people and comfort them right now. Number three. In his perfect love, God provides for us, both spiritually and materially. In Psalm 81, verse 16, uh, we read, God says, But I would feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. God wants to feed us first spiritually. The Bible talks about how uh, new Christians are like newborn babes desiring or needing the milk of the word, the milk of God's word, the Bible, so that they might grow. And um, once you become more mature, it talks about feeding on the meat of the word. What do I mean by that? It means that we need to read our Bibles. If you, if you don't have a Bible, um, you know, just just go and get one, get one online, there's a load of free copies, or, um, you know, why not get a Bible reading plan? There's things like the Bible in one year. And then can I encourage you, don't just read it and let it go in one ear and out the other. There's this whole idea of feeding or feasting on God's Word. 
I, I like when I'm reading the Bible to sort of uh, allow God to sort of uh, arrest me to a certain verse that may be speaking to me. In fact, you might like to just take these notes after, after this service and just go through them again. And maybe there's a particular thing that I've said has spoken to you and just pause and ponder and write it down and think about how it applies to you. That's the way we feed on the word. So God wants to provide for us spiritually, but God also wants to provide for you and me in this particular situation materially. You know, there's a simple prayer in the, the, in the Lord's Prayer. There's a line that says this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then it goes like this, Give us today our daily bread. I believe like never before, many of us are going to need to pray that prayer, almost like a, a daily dependence on, Lord, on the Lord. Lord, will you provide for our needs? And then again, let's be open to being channels of meeting other people's needs, maybe helping uh, by distributing food at the, the, your local food bank or being alert to people around you who are in need. And then number four, in his perfect love, God defends us. God defends us. I remember years ago, while Karen and I were in South Africa, we were, on, um, we were out there and we went on safari. We got in the Jeep and the ranger who was taking us out decided he wanted to go and find um, a pride of lions. And so we drove along. We came round the corner and we started hearing uh, this roaring from the pride. It's like they heard we were coming. And then literally, as soon as we turned the corner and we had our first sight of the lions, this mummy lion came charging at the jeep. Um, I'll never forget the look in her eyes, one of, you know, just fierce love saying, in effect, don't you come near my babies. <laughs> and literally she kept running and running. Uh, the guy who was, um, who, who was the, the, the ranger literally had to put it in reverse. We had some um, foreign visitors, some Germans and others in the back, and they were, they were sort of panicking and freaking out. I'll never forget the look in that mother lion's eyes. Why? She, she was defending her cubs. Can I say, God is like that and even more. God is an all-loving, all-powerful God and he wants to defend us at this time and at all times. And so it, with that in mind, we can say along with Paul in Romans 8 verse 31, if God is for us, this almighty, all-loving God, who can be against us? Number five, in his perfect love, God protects us. God protects us. Heard a story recently of a forest fire and in the aftermath of the fire, the firefighters went out and that they surveyed the landscape and they noticed an adult bird that was dead, sort of almost like half charred. And they thought, what's going on there? Uh, why, why didn't the bird fly away when the, when, when the fire came? And as they went to inspect, they took this, this dead body, they lifted it up and out from under, four little chicks popped up alive and well. What was happening? This Mother bird literally laid her life down protecting her chicks. Can I say God is like that, this and even more. He wants to protect you and protect me. One of the, the best declarations to make over our own lives and our families indeed over others around us at this time is in Psalm 91. The whole psalm is worth reading and declaring. But I just want to read the first few verses um, from verse 1. Listen to this. It says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. Can I encourage you like never before, why not turn to God? God is the safe refuge. He wants to protect and cover you in, in and through this crisis in Jesus' name. And then number six, in his perfect love, God watches over us. Again, another memory from uh, when our girls were younger. We would go down to the south coast and there's a favourite beach we'd go to and the girls would have a wonderful time. 
For hours and hours, they would play, frolicking around, making sandcastles, um, diving into the sea. And yet through the whole time, Karen never ever took her eye off them. Why? She was watching over her girls with almost like a, a protective mother's love. The Bible says this, Psalm 121, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and evermore. Can I say right now, whether you're on your own, maybe you're in self-isolation, maybe you are with family, but you're still struggling. Can I say, God is watching over you. And then finally, in his perfect love, God rescues us. Another family memory. This time, uh, back to when I was 16, we were on a family holiday um, in the Black Forest in Germany. And we were on a campsite and there was a particular pool come lake. It was, like, it was open air and I was out swimming, as were my two younger brothers. Um, what we didn't know was that sort of halfway along, this, this pool had a sudden kind of like sheer drop. And there came a point where I was swimming away and my two younger brothers suddenly got in trouble. That They went over this ledge, they were getting out of their depth, they weren't strong swimmers, and I didn't even notice, but someone noticed my mum. Next thing I knew or I heard was this massive splash as my mum charged into the water, fully clothed, swam out, and literally, I believe, believe saved the lives of my two brothers. God is like that and even more. He is a saving God. He's a God who wants to rescue us when we're in trouble. In fact, the whole of Christianity really is about a rescue mission. It's about a God who's not aloof from our suffering. It's a God who came to this earth in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus grew up, um, he lived, he set people free. He, through his perfect love, set them free from fear and sickness and even raised people from the dead. And then on a cross, he died for our sins to rescue us, to forgive us from our past and to give us a hope and an eternal future. And then three days later on what we know as Easter, Easter he rose from the dead and he is alive today. God is a God who in his love has come to rescue us. Listen to how Paul puts it in Titus 3 verse 5. It says, when the extraordinary compassion of God our Saviour and his overpowering love suddenly appeared in person as the brightness of a dawning day, he came to save us. Or we could say, he came to rescue us. It means that as we receive Jesus, we can be without fear because we know that our past has been forgiven. He has saved us. He's in our lives and he's working. He is saving us. He will deliver us right now. And then eternally he will save us so that we don't have to fear death. In the words of Paul again in Romans 8 verse 39, Paul's been talking about all the kind of stuff that we face in life, trials and, and, and um, all kinds of situations. He says this, no matter what happens, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the cure, this is the antidote for all fear. It's the perfect love of God. And when we have received that love and when we're aware of that love, this love literally drives out fear. It means that we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 4 verse 8, now because of you, Lord, I will lie down in peace and sleep at once for no matter what happens, I will live unafraid. I love that. What wonderful news this Mother's Day and can, can I say every day and maybe particularly wonderful news in the situation we're facing right now. But the reality is it's one thing to know about this love, sort of intellectually, we, we've heard about it, but just like say in the natural, if, if they ever come up and we trust they will, a vaccine um, for the virus, the only way it's going to benefit you and me is if we actually were to receive it. Well, in order for us to benefit from this love, this perfect love, we actually have to receive it. And then, of course, 
Let's be generous with this, this best news, with this antidote, and let's find as many people as we can and let's share this good news with them too. So as I begin to conclude, let me just ask you a question. Have you received the perfect love of God? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you welcomed his Holy Spirit in? If you haven't, I'd love to pray for you. Or it may be that you have received the love of God and you'd say, I am a Christian, I know God. But there's something about this situation that right now is overwhelming you and you've temporarily taken your eye off that and fear has got a grip. Well then, I'd like to include you in this prayer as you almost like come back to God, come under his covering and his protection, reaffirm your faith in him and receive his love afresh. So right where you are, I'd like to just encourage you um, to join me in a prayer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a phrase at a time. I'd like you to pray it. You can either pray it quietly or out loud and you might just like to close close your eyes right now as we pray together. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for your perfect love that casts out all fear. This day, I choose to turn to you. And I receive the gift of your love based on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Forgive me my sin Come into my life, fill me with your Holy Spirit and cast out all fear. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer from your heart, you've just taken the most important step of your life because because God has heard your prayer. And and what we'd like to do is help you in any way we can. And so um, you'll you'll see a link come up, uh, our Transform Life website, and go to the Knowing God section. You can find out how to take next steps and just let us know the decision uh, you've made. And if if you've enjoyed this service, you found it helpful, why not share with a friend and invite a whole bunch of people to join the journey too?